You can support In the Past Lane with as little as $1 a month. Just go to the support page at our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. In 1928, Governor Alfred E. Smith of New York was one of the best-known politicians in the United States. He was famous for signing into law landmark social legislation that improved the lives of the poor and vulnerable. Al Smith ran for president that year, but was soundly defeated by Herbert Hoover. But in that same election, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a friend and protege of Al Smith, won election as governor of New York. Four years later, in the midst of the Great Depression, FDR won election as president. Over the next decade, he would sign into law hundreds of bills that established on a national level what Al Smith had pioneered at the state level in New York. He called it the New Deal, and it forever changed the Democratic Party and the nation. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 149, in which we dive into the story of two very different men, Al Smith and FDR, who teamed up to reinvent the modern Democratic Party in the early 20th century. We are brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and come to you this week from the Tammany Hall Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Piloting the good ship in the past lane is our intrepid executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So what's happening in the past lane this week? Well, I'm continuing to enjoy the slower pace of things, now that the semester is in the rearview mirror. Although I do still have to write that annual report for the history department, so I'm not completely free of the professor stuff. The weather here in New England has been spectacular of late, and I've been enjoying a lot of running and cycling, as well as yard work. And even though it's warm and sunny, these days all of New England is thinking about ice. Or, more precisely, ice hockey. That's because our mighty Boston Bruins play in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals tonight. The puck drops in just a few hours, and this historian is very excited. And of course, being a Boston fan, very nervous. In other news, I'm working on new podcast episodes. Just this morning I had a great interview with Nathaniel Philbrick about his new book about the American Revolution. I've also been preparing an upcoming episode featuring historian Joshua Specht talking about his new book, Red Meat Republic. It's basically a history of how Americans became a beef-obsessed nation. Fascinating stuff, just in time for the backyard grilling season. All right, let's get to the main feature of this episode. But before we do, remember that you can support the podcast by buying some of our merchandise, like t-shirts, mugs, and stickers. We've got lots of stuff with the In the Past Lane logo on it but also many t-shirts with quotes by historical figures like Abraham Lincoln and James Baldwin. And remember, everything you buy brings a little revenue that helps defray the costs of making this podcast. Just go to our website, inthepastlane.com, and click on Merchandise. Thanks. Okay, people, let's jump aboard the express train to Albany, New York. Your journey in the past lane begins now. It's impossible to overstate the significance of the New Deal. It fundamentally changed the relationship between Americans and their federal government. Before the New Deal, the average American had very little or even no contact with the federal government. But after the New Deal, the federal government was deeply embedded in the lives of all Americans. Just think of all those federal programs that were created in the 1930s. Social Security, unemployment insurance, welfare benefits, public housing, FHA loans for private home buyers, the 40-hour work week and the minimum wage, banking regulation and deposit insurance, and consider all those building projects, from the Hoover Dam and federal highways to thousands of public buildings like high schools and post offices. It's extraordinary. And the purpose of this massive undertaking by President Franklin Roosevelt and the Democratic Party was 
to minimize suffering, eliminate potential disasters like unemployment and financial mismanagement, and boost economic opportunity for all. In short, the New Deal was all about promoting the common good, based on the theory that the government had an obligation to help those in need, and in so doing, it would benefit all. This episode is about that origin story, how two men from radically different backgrounds, one a patrician who went to Harvard, and the other a son of immigrants who didn't finish the eighth grade, who teamed up to transform the Democratic Party into the party of the urban, immigrant, and African-American working class. This was called the New Deal Coalition, and it played a key role in American life from the 1930s through the 1970s. Here with me today to tell this story is journalist and historian Terry Galway. He's the author of a new book, Frank and Al, FDR, Al Smith, and the Unlikely Alliance that Created the Modern Democratic Party. Galway is the author of many works of history, including Machine Made, The Irish in America, and Washington's General, Nathaniel Green and the Triumph of the American Revolution. He's currently senior editor at Politico. And I should add that Terry and I go way back to my days in New York in the 1990s. Terry Galway, welcome to In the Pass Lane. Thanks, Ed. It's great to be here. Well, most listeners to this podcast probably feel like they know at least a pretty good amount about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but that's not the case regarding the other half of the book, the guy Al Smith. So maybe you could start us off by telling our listeners about who this man who in the first third of the 20th century was probably far better known to America than FDR. So who is this guy Al Smith? Well, Al Smith was a four-time governor of New York. This was at a time when New York governors served two terms. So he didn't serve, you know, 16 years. In fact, he served eight. But they were eight very uh, important years in American history and in New York history. He was first elected in 1918 as the first Catholic to be elected governor of New York. He lost uh, re-election in 1920, and then he went on to win three more terms. In 1928, he became the first Catholic to win a major party's presidential nomination. He lost in a a landslide to Herbert Hoover. One of the things he did, though, in 1928, when he knew that he wasn't going to be running for governor again, he needed somebody to help him win New York. He needed somebody to succeed him who would continue his legacy. And he chose Franklin Roosevelt, who, of course, had been out of politics since contracting polio in 1921, So this was the beginning of Roosevelt's comeback in 1928, and Smith was responsible for that. And then in a a very little-known episode in American political history, Smith actually ran against Franklin Roosevelt for the Democratic presidential nomination in 1932, a very bitter primary that caused a great deal of estrangement between the two of them. So Smith and Roosevelt's careers are intertwined. And Smith today is probably best known as the namesake of the Al Smith Dinner, which is held every year in New York to raise money for Catholic charities. But most people pay attention to it every four years when, by tradition, the two presidential candidates come and make fun of each other. That's right. It's supposed to be a lighthearted affair. So that's the sort of overarching story there. These are two guys who come from very different worlds, and then they come together in the 20s to form a very important political duo. And really, as the title of your book, they really remake the Democratic Party. And then there's a a really tragic kind of falling apart. So before we go there, let's circle back to the beginning, because I think it's probably worth pointing out just how profoundly different these two people are. I mean, they're both born in the state of New York in the 1870s, and that's about it. You know, Al Smith comes from the city streets of the Lower East Side, and he's very much a, a working class guy with a minimal education. And FDR is this silver spoon upstate New York guy. So let's start with Al Smith, a little bit more about his background, and then pivoting to FDR, just how different they were, which makes their coming together all the more interesting. Al Smith was born in 1873 on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. He's often portrayed as coming from a very poor background. That's not so, but certainly he was not wealthy by any means. He's brought up in the city streets. He's got an apartment on South Street. The family himself, his sister and the two parents live on South Street. He he watches the Brooklyn Bridge as it's rising to completion. And he writes about it later on in his life, about how much that meant to him to watch this miracle of technology, you know, uniting the separate city of Brooklyn at the time with the separate city of New York. But his his life changes immeasurably when he's 13 years old, when his father dies after a, a long illness. 
that forced them to move a couple of times as he was unable to work because he was so sick. So the, the family had to move at least twice to cheaper apartments on the Lower East Side. And at that point, Smith feels that he's got to go out. And in the way people thought years ago, and perhaps even today, he had to be the man of the family now. Yeah, the breadwinner. Yes, exactly. And in those days, of course, families like that are incredibly vulnerable. The mother could easily lose the children. Absolutely. And so he's got to get out there. And he, what, he's 13, 13 and a half years old, roughly in eighth grade, I think. Yes, he leaves school just shy of graduating from eighth grade from St. James School on the Lower East Side gets a job and is an eager and hard worker, works at a succession of jobs before he gets into politics, the most famous of them being he was working at the Fulton Fish Market for actually less than two years. But for sort of history nerds like myself, yep. we always associate Al Smith with working for the Fulton Fish Market. And he almost made a career out of telling people that he was an FFM man, meaning Fulton Fish Market. That's right. Yeah, yeah, he didn't have a JD and he didn't have a PhD. He had exactly. he had an FFM, and I think that that was sort of his calling card. His working class cred came from the fact that he that's worked right. at the market because that's hard, backbreaking work. It's messy work. It's three a.m. you know, twelve hour shifts kind of work. So I think he took a lot of pride in that and realized it, it was a good credential to have. He did, he did, and you know, after a while, he sort of, as in the way of things, when politics was practiced in a different way in New York and elsewhere. He got to know uh, his local Tammany Hall district leader, a guy named Tom Foley, who, who took a shine to Smith because Foley himself had lost his father at a young age who had to go out and go to work. He was a saloon keeper at the time and therefore was an important person right. you know, in his community. So it was Tom Foley who noticed that people liked Al Smith. He spoke well. You know, He was an entertainer. In fact, Smith had ideas of being an actor until he fell in love with a young woman whose parents didn't want their daughter marrying an actor. Right, right. He, she was a slightly upper class version of Irish Catholic. That's exactly right. Than he was. And he really had to make a choice about whether he'd go with the theater. Because apparently, you know, there are old playbills that show him starring yep. in shows. And he would use that talent, that singing, that sort of stage presence. It was easily transferable to politics. And politics, even though that was a little bit unsavory in some ways, was, I guess, more more respectable than the theater. Yes. And Smith was a performer, too, is his dying day. I mean, you can go on YouTube and find some old grainy newsreels of Smith in front of a microphone singing songs about the Bowery, you know? Right, the Bowery. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the vaudeville never left him. No, vaudeville never left him. That's absolutely right. So that's Al Smith's background. And now there's another performer mm -hmm. <laughs> who is awfully good on radio. And that was, of course, Franklin Roosevelt, who lives 90 miles away from the Lower East Side, up the Hudson River. And one of the things I do in the book is the way I sort of introduce these two different worlds is I kind of give a bird's eye journey down the Hudson River from Hyde Park, which is where Franklin Roosevelt is born in 1882 and I transport the readers, at least I think I do, uh, down the Hudson River from the sort of uh, pristine, uh, patrician background and habitat of Franklin Roosevelt, and I take readers down the Hudson River to Manhattan, where, where basically the river is just an open sewer. Right, you can walk across it. You know, that's one way of trying to show these two different worlds that they lived in, that their houses overlooked rivers, but <laughs> they mm -hmm. were very different kinds of views. But, you know, Roosevelt, of course, is, is a Roosevelt. He's, he's born into privilege. His father is a little bit older when Franklin was born because he had been married before and widowed. You know, he grew up in Hyde Park. He grew up on the river. Right. When his family traveled across the United States, they traveled in his private rail car. As a young boy, you know, he went to Paris. He went to Europe, as, as would be expected of somebody from his class. And he went to Groton, the boarding school, and then went to Harvard, where his father had gone. And he, too, lost his father at a relatively young age. He was a freshman at Harvard when his father died. But needless to say, he was taken care of. Right. It was emotionally difficult, but not potentially catastrophic, as it was in the case for Al Smith. Exactly. So these two, you know, these two individuals could really could not have had a different kind of background. And, and, you know, we haven't even talked about the difference in religion, which back then, you know, it was a big deal that, you know, Franklin Roosevelt was an Anglo-Dutch Protestant. 
who could probably trace his, you know, bloodlines to the Mayflower, and Al Smith who was a Catholic. He embraced an Irish identity, although in fact he was half Italian, or perhaps even less. Maybe he was part Irish, Italian, and German, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But the really important thing was that he was Catholic at a time when, you know, being Catholic really meant, and this is, you know, hard for us to think about in the 21st century, but to to be a Catholic in in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, or beyond was really to be a member of a minority group, because religion was such an important dividing line in American society in ways that, you know, today we think Catholics, Christians, right, those differences don't matter as much as they used to, but they really did back then. So that really was, I mean, there was a class divide between the two, but the religious divide, which is associated with class, of course, It's pretty Mm -hmm. important as well. Right. And so in the early 20th century, both men get interested in politics. And Al Smith will be recognized for his speaking ability and his, he joins, you mentioned Tammany Hall earlier. We should point out Tammany Hall is the famous political machine, political organization that really runs the show in New York City and to a large extent in the state of New York. And they, they see his talent before long. He's in the state legislature. And then by 1911, Franklin Roosevelt is in the state legislature as well. And this is where these two very different people meet up there in Albany. Tell us about that meeting and how that goes and how they, you know, they don't become fast drinking buddies right off the bat. No, they don't. So Franklin Roosevelt and Al Smith meet in 1911. Was Roosevelt has just been elected to the state Senate in 1910. So he has no seniority, right? The only, <laughs> the only thing he's got going for him is that he's a Roosevelt. At a time, of course, when Theodore Roosevelt is this young ex-president who's very much in the news all the time. I mean, uh, Teddy Roosevelt in New York in 1911 is a virtual celebrity. You know, I think he's just come back from Africa, where he went after he uh, gave up the presidency. So he's a Roosevelt, and he's a Democrat. So he's a natural curiosity. And he comes to Albany, and he decides, well, you know, he's going to make his presence known. He's going to He's going to take on Tammany Hall. So he immediately creates a ruckus by refusing to go along with Tammany's choice for United States Senator, because this was the dying days of of when legislatures chose the United States Senator. So he's creating quite a scene and getting quite a bit of publicity as the great reformer. Al Smith, Mm -hmm. who is a machine politician, and his good friend Robert Wagner, who goes on to become the great New Deal Senator, The two of them one night, and I will tell you that this story is based on Al Smith's recollections, and in the way I tell the story, I do a little bit of imagining what it must have been like Mm -hmm. for these two, although young, relatively powerful, very powerful legislators. Smith has just been named majority leader of the assembly, number two, and Wagner at the age of 31 is the president of the state senate. And we know because Smith tells us that at some point, Wagner had to go over across the street from the state capitol and meet with Franklin Roosevelt in his living room. And I know a little bit about politics after all of these years, my being a journalist and a historian. That had to be a humiliating task. Wagner going over to this guy who's been in office two weeks you know, right. on his terms. So the way Smith tells the story, they're going over I'm assuming that they went to talk about this controversy over the United States Senate pick. What else would they be talking about? Right. It was the issue. Right. The way Smith tells the story, they go over, Roosevelt has a $400 a month townhouse across the street from the Capitol. This at a time when the salary for a state senator was about $1,500 a year. Right. And most of them were living in boarding houses. Exactly. Yes. Smith and Wagner were roommates to save Mm -hmm. money. So they knock on the door and... (laughs) Who answers? Not Eleanor, who was there, not Franklin, but the butler. <laughs> right. And again, these two guys from Manhattan knock on the door and a butler answers. And the butler says, well, Senator Roosevelt is expecting Senator Wagner. And then the butler, as Smith tells it, looks at him. And I can only imagine the look at the scowl of disapproval. Here's this, you know, guest who hasn't made reservations. He doesn't have a calling card. Yes. I imagine that Smith, I'm sure he had a cigar. He always had a cigar. Yep. You know, he had this Lower East Side accent that I'm sure the butler had never heard before. And Smith just 
looks at him and says, that's okay. I'm coming in too. Yep. <laughs> he walks in and that's where he meets Franklin Roosevelt. We don't know what they talked about. They never said, but, but I use that scene at the beginning of the book to sort of convey to readers how unlikely this was Right. <laughs> that years later they would become allies for progressive and liberal causes. Yeah, it, it is so fascinating. And, and a lot is happening in that year, 1911. That's the year of the tragic Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. And apart from Franklin Roosevelt, Tammany Hall, which has, you know, for a long, long time been kind of the Robin Hood party, right? They steal lots of money, but then they sprinkle money out to the working class. And for most of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, Tammany opposed reform. They liked things just like the way they were. You know, they helped out the, the poor, but they weren't really interested in changing the system. And that all begins to change right around this time where Tammany Hall officials like Al Smith realize they've got to, if they want to keep getting votes, they can't just, you know, deliver free groceries and pay for people's funerals and free rounds of beer. They have to actually deliver legislation that's going to help the working class. And that's a new chapter in Tammany Hall. And it would you say in some ways that's what allows these two to come together? Because Roosevelt shows up as a reformer and Al Smith is essentially becoming a reformer. Absolutely. I mean, that's where things, the whole dynamic begins to change. But what's interesting about that time period, and you're absolutely right, in New York history and American history, you know, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire is a, is a great divide. Uh, social welfare measures sort of can be traced either before the Triangle Fire or after. And as a result of that fire, Tammany's boss, Charlie Murphy, a saloon keeper, uh, realizes that the time has come to change. And he sort of okays a special commission to investigate factories, and he names as the chairs of that committee, which is loaded up with reformers and elite patricians who've been arguing for reform. Good government types. Good government types. The people at the head of the committee, though, are Robert Wagner and Al Smith, and they investigate conditions and over the next two years, you know, they introduce things that, yes, of course, you know, sprinklers and inspections and, and all sorts of fire prevention measures. But they also start to do things like a $2 guaranteed daily wage for canal workers and a college scholarship for poor students. So they took this tragedy as an opportunity to expand the social contract in New York. Franklin Roosevelt had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. He was utterly uninterested, but it did allow Smith to show to these elite reformers and good government types that he was on their side, but more to the point, he could get things done because he understood the mechanics of politics in ways that reformers who often stood apart from the system because the system was corrupt and therefore they would not be corrupted themselves. But as a result, they stood on soapboxes and demanded change, but had no way of doing it. And Smith showed that if they put their faith in this machine politician, that he could get things done. So you're right. It's at that moment where people like Bell Moskowitz, who is a very important figure in the book, uh, she was a civic reformer, Robert Moses, the great and controversial Parks Commissioner, they're from the civic reform movement. They look at Smith and say, here's a guy who can get things done. And he helps them also see that reform you know, comes in many forms. And so a lot of these elites like Roosevelt's and Moskowitz and others, they're really interested in good government, which means you know, cutting the payroll, civil service, rooting out corruption. And it's not as though Smith and working class people oppose those things. It's just that they see them as far less important than delivering tangible benefits, you know, factory safety legislation, tenement reform workman's compensation, that's the stuff that working class people want more than anything else. And then along the way, if you can make government more efficient, so be it. So let's jump ahead here. This is where they meet. And this is an important time of change. And the reform is in the air because it's what we call the progressive era. And FDR in 1913 goes on to become the assistant secretary of the Navy in the Wilson administration. So he's in politics, but he's a, sort of starting out at a very high level. Smith has come from the streets. At a certain point, he moves on from the state legislature, becomes sheriff of New York, and then president of the Board of Aldermen. And then, as you noted at the beginning, in 1918, he runs for governor and he wins. And this is a big moment for Al Smith and also for this time period. Tell us what happens next as Smith becomes governor and takes some of these reform ideas. Now he's in charge of the state of New York, which we should point out 
is incredibly important. Like what happens in New York really dictates or shapes national politics. Yeah, New York, I guess the comparison to today would be to California. I mean, New York at yes. the time had 45 electoral votes, by far, you know, the, the largest number of votes. And, you know, if you were governor of New York, you were de facto a presidential candidate, even if you didn't want to be. But most of them did. Sure. You know, so there's a succession of New York governors who are nominated and in cases like Teddy Roosevelt and others win uh, Grover Cleveland. So Smith takes the reins of power. Everybody thinks he's going to turn uh, the state government over to Tammany Hall and Charles Murphy. And, and you, you read these uh, hand-wringing editorials bemoaning the fact that a Tammany guy is now in charge of the government, when in fact he turns government over to experts. He turns government over to people like Robert Moses, right. who writes this long document about how to reconstruct a uh, New York government, now the veterans are coming home and they're going to need housing, they're going to need health care. How can New York best respond to that? And there are others like uh, I mentioned before, Bell Moskowitz, who begin to argue uh, that now is the chance to, to pass things like a better workers' compensation program, you know, the beginnings of minimum wage, all of these things uh, Smith begins to put in motion in his first two-year term. Of course, you know, these days it's hard to imagine an executive with a two-year term although there might be people out there who would argue in favor of it at the moment. Right. But a two-year term is hardly time to get anything done. But Smith began to accomplish a lot of reform, and people start to notice. And all of a sudden, Franklin Roosevelt down in Washington is writing him letters saying, wow, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really impressed with what you're doing. Oh, and by the way, a friend of mine over in Dutchess County needs a job. Right. You think you could put him in touch with somebody? <laughs> you know, Roosevelt, who had campaigned against patronage, is now soliciting jobs for his friends with Al Smith. So, yeah, what that tells me about Roosevelt, too, is that he's learned what the realities of government are. He's a quick learner. Yeah, and he's learning them from people like Al Smith. Right, and so Smith has a very impressive first term, but then he loses in 1920. Yes. And so, too, does Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt was tabbed to be the vice president on the 1920 Democratic ticket, which loses the election. So both of them are suddenly out of office in 1920, and Al Smith is in some ways thinking this may be the end of our run. Doesn't he write a letter to FDR to that effect? Yeah. Coincidentally, they both write to each other right after their defeat. And Smith basically says, you know, this is probably for the better. And Roosevelt is saying, you know, we're not going to run for office again. And he's basically saying, well, we're done. And mind you, they're not very old. I mean, right. Roosevelt is certainly still in his 30s and Smith is early 40s. So they're sort of saying, yeah, we're done. But what's interesting is that Roosevelt says to Smith, look, we may be done, but you and I know the New York Democratic Party like no other people. And we ought to get together and put our heads together and figure out how to rebuild this party. And I look forward to continued conversations. And then, of course, not long thereafter, he comes down with polio. And that sort of rebuilding project between the two of them never materializes in the way they would have imagined. Right. And in some ways, it would appear that Franklin Roosevelt's political career is over. But Al Smith is in the ascendant and pushing this progressive agenda, drawing lots of national attention for this kind of path-breaking politics. And in 1924, he is going to put his name forward uh, for the nomination for the Democratic Party and coincidentally the Democratic National Conventions in New York City at Madison Square Garden. So he seems sort of perfectly positioned for this and he tabs a recovering Franklin Roosevelt to be his campaign manager and to introduce him at the convention. But this is one of the most contested, fractious, ugly conventions in American political history, and it doesn't go Al Smith's way. Tell us about what happens in 1924. Well, the convention was at Madison Square Garden in New York. You had two main contestants, Al Smith, who was representing kind of the urban ethnic wing of the Democratic Party, representing factory workers and Catholics and Jews, basically, and people who maybe were dubious about prohibition. And then you had, as the other contestant, William Gibbs McAdoo, a traditional progressive in the Woodrow Wilson School. In fact, he was Woodrow Wilson's son-in-law and had been his treasury secretary and had been very friendly with Franklin Roosevelt. He also had the support of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. And the Klan, this was covered at the time as a matter of fact, that the Klan had infiltrated or had overwhelmed more than a dozen delegations, including delegations from the Midwest and, and even in the North. That's right. That's the thing that's really worth pointing out, which is that this is Klan 2.0, which is 
more national than the original Klan of the 1870s and 1880s. And it's hostile to African Americans, but it's also now hostile to Catholics and Jews and immigrants. So they are incredibly powerful by the mid-1920s. Incredibly powerful in the Democratic Party, which I think a lot of people might find surprising. So they are determined. They, they are lined up behind McAdoo, who is you know, the Smith's opponent. McAdoo is asked to condemn the Klan, and he won't do it because mm-hmm. he knows that's yeah. where most of his support is. And Smith lays down a marker. He and another candidate, although he's more of a dark horse, and a senator from Alabama, Oscar Underwood, is anti-Klan, which is rather brave of him. And they get together and they come up with a plank in the platform. And these were days when people actually did pay attention to conventions and what was in the platform. And they proposed a plank, a clause in the platform, saying that you know the Democratic Party condemns the Ku Klux Klan. You would think a no-brainer, right? Right. <laughs> Incorrect. That debate went on behind the scenes and on the convention floor for days at a time. Smith was adamant that he wanted it. There were people, including Franklin Roosevelt, who said, no, let's compromise. Right. And William Jennings Bryan says, let's just condemn secret societies. Mm-hmm. And Smith would have none of it. And as a result, that controversial plank went to a vote, and it lost by a single vote. So now the convention is utterly divided, you know, between those who supported the Klan and those who opposed it. And then Smith representing the anti-Klan and McAdoo sort of Mm. representing the Klan and others fought it out for two and a half weeks, over 102 ballots. And Smith was not going to allow McAdoo to win, even though McAdoo had the more votes, but you had to have two thirds of the votes. That was the key. Mm. Until finally exhausted, after on the 103rd ballot, they nominate a, a compromise candidate named John Davis, who he's subsequently loses in a landslide to Calvin Coolidge. And most people, many scholars, regard that convention as an unmitigated disaster. In my telling, it's actually the beginning of a new Democratic Party. Right. It's the seeds of what later we'll call the New Deal Coalition are clearly planted there because they win by losing in terms of exactly what the party will become and who the party will represent. Yes. And I see it as a victory for Al Smith and his people because they block McAdoo, first of all. They make it clear that the Klan, at least in an overt form, <laughs> you know, is not welcome in this party and that there's this new party that is being born in this chaos and confusion of 1924. So I actually see 24 as a convention as more of a triumph than a tragedy for the party. And that's really borne out four years later when Al Smith is back at the convention, also seeking the nomination. And at this point, he's just that much more popular and more powerful, and he can't be denied. He chooses FDR, again, to be his campaign manager and the man who introduces him as the happy warrior, which is phrase that comes to describe Al Smith. And Smith wins on the first ballot. No prolonged convention this time. Right. So it's a real triumph at that moment for that kind of politics and these two men who form this this alliance. But the campaign goes really, really badly for Al Smith. He's the urban guy from New York City in the era of Prohibition and the Klan. And he loses the 1928 election by a landslide to Herbert Hoover. You know, and this election is incredibly ugly. There's all kinds of anti-Catholicism in the rhetoric, and there's burning crosses along the train tracks of the Al Smith campaign train. So it's a really dark moment for Smith. But for FDR, it's the beginning of something. So tell us that transition that takes place where FDR's stock is rising as Smith's stock is plummeting. Smith really tabbed uh, Roosevelt, talked Roosevelt into running for governor in 1928, although most Scholars agree that Smith probably would have preferred Herbert Lehman, who wound up being the lieutenant governor that year and then later governor of New York. So Roosevelt is running. He was reluctant to. His political advisor, famous political advisor, Louis Howe, said this is not a year for a Democrat. Of course, he was right. Mm -hmm. So, But Roosevelt runs anyway, risking the fact that he would lose and and very likely was going to lose. And and who knows, you know, now he's a two-time loser because he had lost a a Senate race earlier. So he does that. And what was so impressive to me about Roosevelt on the campaign trail, in addition to his absolute determination, you can read Francis Perkins, who was his labor secretary, and others talk about what it was like to smile and wave to people and speak standing up when you were on crutches or you had these braces on his legs. But at one point, he's up near Binghamton in in the southern tier of New York, which is generally thought of as the capital of the Klan in New York. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And late in the election, gives this stinging rebuke. In essence, says, if you are going to vote against Al Smith because he's a Catholic, then don't vote for me either. Because I don't want your vote. You know, Mm. people like you should be deported. (laughs) Right. And I think it was very brave of Roosevelt. And, you know, he wound up winning. And it was the beginning of his comeback. His comeback and then also the partial disintegration of their relationship. Smith loses his election, so he sort of thinks he's going to hang around and kind of be a shadow governor of of Roosevelt. And Roosevelt says, no, thank you. And Roosevelt also gets rid of a couple of his key advisors, which irks Al Smith. And then four years later, as you noted at the beginning, they square off in the 1932 election for president in the Democratic nomination phase of that. And FDR ultimately triumphs, largely because he gets some help from Al Smith's former key lieutenants. And that re- really causes a pretty big break with the two. And, and in the coming couple of years, FDR launches the New Deal and really, in some ways, you know, takes many of the same ideas and same programs that Al Smith had been so successful in pioneering in New York State and makes them national, makes them part of the New Deal and, you know, pushing social legislation and economic recovery and so forth. And Al Smith is very much out there in the, in the wilderness. So what happens next? He's bitter. He takes these things very personally. And their relationship is is seemingly over forever. And Smith involves himself ultimately with anti-New Dealers. Yes. Historians have been puzzling over this transformation in Al Smith for many years. uh, And I think it's a combination of things. I think he was bitter about Roosevelt's rise. I think there was some part of him that felt that he should have been president. He was a student of government, and Franklin Roosevelt was a lightweight. I think that's how they regarded him. Mm -hmm. I think part of it was that Smith really did not like the idea of so much centralization of power in Washington. You know, he was a governor. You know, he liked the idea that states, well, I don't want to say states' rights because that's not what he meant, but I think he felt that, you know, local government was best and centralizing power was almost communistic, right? right? So I think that was part of it. But I also think that he felt that, in essence, that Roosevelt had disrespected him and that, you know, he never quite got over that. Although they do have a reconciliation. One of the things that I discovered in reading this book and writing this book is that Smith very early on recognized the danger of Adolf Hitler. And he's speaking primarily to Jewish groups in New York as early as 1933 warning them about what might happen in Europe as a result of Nazism. And, you know, to read his speeches today is to say, wow, this, here's somebody who knew right away. You know, we know about how Winston Churchill figured that out. Al Smith figured it out as well. And so when in the late 30s and early 40s, before Pearl Harbor, when Roosevelt is trying to maneuver American foreign policy on behalf of the Allies, which is not very popular, right. Smith is with him 100%. And Roosevelt writes letters acknowledging Smith's contribution, and that's the beginning of their reconciliation. Yeah, and that's the part that I had never, I mean, I felt like I knew a lot about Al Smith. You know, I teach courses on Irish American history, Tammany Hall. I've written a lot about it like you have. And the story always has bothered me that Al Smith turned so negative and so, you know, allied himself with the Liberty League and all. And that's, that's all I ever knew, that it just went badly and he was sort of a bitter old man. I had no idea that there was this really genuine reconciliation that occurred. And I was really glad to, to learn that and to see that it was not only just sort of a paper thin one, but a really genuine one, that they became friends again and allies in common cause. Yes. So this is an amazing story of, of the first half of the 20th century and the remaking of the Democratic Party. What's the, you know, for today's audience, you see a lot of questions about the Democratic Party and its potential reformulations. What's in your mind the takeaway for a modern audience from this? Why does this story of Al Smith and FDR matter now? I think it shows that two people from two very different traditions within the same party, Roosevelt sort of representing the elite progressivism that was associated with good government and elite causes, and the urban pragmatism, the urban liberalism of Al Smith, they don't have to be on separate sides of a chasm. You can build bridges. And at a time when the Democratic Party is having a conversation with itself about some of the same issues, immigration, working class, etc., that the progressive wing of the party, which is a little different from Roosevelt's time, and the sort of urban liberals, that they don't necessarily, they're not on opposite sides. They're actually fighting for things that they have in common. Right. You don't have to make a single choice. There are options out there. 
Well, Terry Galway, this has been great, and your book is really fantastic and well-timed and informative, even for those of us who think we know a lot about the Democratic Party and the story of Tammany Hall and Al Smith. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Terry Galway is the author of Frank and Al, FDR, Al Smith, and the unlikely alliance that created the modern Democratic Party. Published by St. Martin's Press and available wherever books are sold. Okay, past laners. As always, this has been a lot of fun. But alas, we are out of time. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. And please leave a starred review. And tell your friends about In the Past Lane. Thanks. Let's also continue the conversation via social media. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at In the Past Lane, and on Facebook at In the Past Lane Podcast. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, June 14th is coming up. Any plans to celebrate Flag Day? Working on my Betsy Ross voodoo doll. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. Mm-hmm.